what we have now is a, a tool that has been built over the course of this project that really allows you to um, to to look at the future responses and uh, of customer behavior to changes in price signals. So this whole model is built on this idea that uh, you invest in solar or even some other technology. And since we've done our model training, we can predict, come up with a, a reasonable estimate of what you might expect in the future. And so we're gonna use this study, this tool now to go through a, a case study that uh, looks at um, customer adoption responses to, to various mar market changes. Um, so, so uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, we've we've looked at these various portfolios, and the committee endorsed uh, these uh, these various options back in June. Um, the uh, the what I'll be discussing today is that second option uh, that uh, Brian showed us on that list: rate design tool impacts uh, on market driven solar deployment. Um, this is based on this tool. We've pre presented the tool in the past. I think you, everybody should have a pretty good idea, basically, of what, of what this tool is. I'll give it a brief background uh, in a moment. It's publicly available, so anybody who's interested in this or has any objections to what they see today or, or what have you, it's available and you can use this. Uh, it was presented at the uh, Mencia Gateways Conference as well, and there was another little mini case study that we looked at there. Um, so this is a, a public tool for anybody who would like to, to use it. Um, it does use uh, hourly load data by class. And in the course of this project, we uh, were uh, the three IOUs provided this data to us for use in this study. But that particular data is a little sensitive. And so if you use the tool, you wouldn't be able to use that same data. But you, but you could use a, an alternative, and I'll mention that in a moment. Um, there were three case studies. Uh, by case study, now we're sort of, in this sense, we're now equating them to the three IOUs, Excel Energy, Minnesota Power, and Otter Tail Power. And for each of those, we looked at three different scenarios. And so the questions are, well, what would be the impact, for example, if if a residential demand rate was imposed, that would be this, the same sort of structural rate as the larger commercial customers were used. If it's sort of a, a, a charge for the uh, capacity that's being used by the customer. Um, if residential demand rate was included, and that's now possible with, uh, with more advanced you know, smart metering, you know, what, would be, what would that impact? Uh, how, how would that impact adoption of solar? Would it improve it? Would it, would it cause it to decline? What would happen? Um, what if the similarly uh, or alternatively, what if there was a, a time of day rate introduced uh, like we see in say California? Um, what, would, what, would that, what would the response be to adoption if, uh, if say all the residential customers went on a time of day rate? Um, and then there's uh, various incentive scenarios. Uh, if you want to put so much uh, incentive into customers who adopt, how would that affect the, the adoption? Um, so we'll go through each of these uh, three utilities and we'll go through each of these different scenarios and, and take a look. And, and this is by no means exhaustive. There can be other scenarios. In fact, I'm kind of uh, hoping that this might stimulate some thought and maybe there, there could be all kinds of different definitions of, of scenarios uh, looking forward. And, and this is a, now a tool that can be used to, to do that kind of thing. <clears throat> I'll jump to the conclusions right away. So there's the three case studies. Um, we, we used this solar development strategy tool developed under the project. As for residential demand charges, um, we look out to 2030, so that's, uh, that's 13 years, uh, the way this study was kind of formulated, that's 13 years of response. And if you impose a demand charge, at least under the assumptions we did in this study, it would t have an effect of reducing the cumulative adoption forecast 
uh, by 14% for Excel Energy. Uh, only two and a quarter, per, uh, two point four percent rather for Minnesota Power, eight and a half percent for Ottertail. <clears throat> the similarly, the time of day charges. If you introduce those, and there's a kind of assumptions behind these as well, right? Uh, what are those charges and so on? But those are also shown to you know have it, it, a minor effect really, about you know a little under three percent for Excel Energy. 0.6% for Minnesota Power, hardly even noticeable, certainly within the era of this kind of study. Um, and uh, and the incentives, there's a bunch of incentives that we'll be looking at, and, and they're quite substantial depending on the level of incentives. And, and as you would imagine, that increases the, the uh, adoption rates, and we'll see what those are uh, specifically. Um, and and basically, I think the conclusion is that this tool is is pretty versatile, and you can uh, do a lots of lots of different types of adjustments and see what the impacts are. You can uh, estimate adoption impact, at ultimately as a function of customer payback. So if your study uh, can be framed in such a way that you want to see, uh, so, you know, how does this change customer payback, such as rates, incentives, you know, you could change time of day period definitions or uh, lots of other in anything that's an input to this this tool you can change and see what the uh, what the what the impact uh, is it, it will it will lead to an you know at least an estimate of what that impact is brief background on the planning tool i'm going to go through this pretty quickly because we've seen i think all of these slides so far um, so this is just kind of a reminder um, so it models future adoption you have, for a defined region, such as an IOU territory. It models the behavioral response to cost effectiveness. Um, so uh, as we said, that could be an electric rate change. It could be a different compensation, like if you want to go from NEM to some other alternative incentives and so on. Anything that affects cost effectiveness to the customer. Um, uses these machine learning methods. This regression is applied to uh, predictor variables and it, it, and it trains using those same variables historically, uh, looking at what the adoption has been in the past. And, and, but through this training, this model is developed to, uh, to, to be applied for the future. And just a, kind of an illustration, this is just meant to sort of as an indication of kind of the, the types of calculations that goes through here. And this is, uh, we're looking now at Excel Energy uh, as a, a, a commercial time of day service. Um, and we, we, we go through the hourly load data and we characterize it by, uh, by month. We characterize it by the solar production. So this customer has an associated solar profile, an hourly profile. Uh, and from that hourly load and hourly pr uh, solar profile, we we divvy that, the, we do some sort of preliminary calculations. We calculate the self-consumption, that's the solar that's produced, you know, on the rooftop and used behind the meter. So it never actually registers at the meter, but we know about it because of our solar modeling. Right, so we throw that into the self-consumption bin. Some of that solar production is exported through the meter to the utility. Uh, some of some of the load is supported by energy that's imported from the utility, and from those quantities we can calculate, say, the net export over the month, the net import over the month. In this case, in this example, we're seeing that. It was uh, not importing energy, any energy on a net basis. That is, on a monthly basis, the, these this customer. This illustration shows that for these four months, there that they were a net producer, um, and then we can see what the peak load was with solar and without solar, and that would be relevant for rates that that uh, have a demand charge associated with it. So, and this is this is hourly. Uh, demand. <clears throat> uh, here, here's a, just an example of uh, goodness of fit, which means uh, the blue line is the actual 
uh, adoption. This is um, Excel Energy residential only for illustration purposes. So over the years from 2007 to 2017, we had the data available to us and we're just plotting in blue what the actuals, actual adoptions were. And that's the, in terms of number of adopters cumulatively. And then after our training, we go back and say, well, what, what, what would our one year forecast or three year forecast horizon look at? look like and you, you can see that some years it's it's too high and some years it's too low and that's the forecast error but it tracks pretty well so that gives us a sense going forward if if we uh, what we might expect um, in terms of an accuracy if you will planning tool inputs we have these load profiles um, this, uh, so describing the tool itself, if you were to download this tool and, and use it for your own study, um, there's, uh, you have to supply it with load profiles. You can define your own and just put, put whatever you want that's relevant to your study. Um, in this case, we used the utility provided profiles by class. That's not available for the public, but uh, you know, you could also ask the utility for those if you wanted to do a comparable study. Um, and kind of the default in there is we loaded the tool up with um, a publicly available uh, 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 profiles by class from AEP Ohio. And the only reason that we did AEP Ohio is because that, that was the closest location I could find that, that, um, that had these public profiles available. Maybe there's something better, I don't know, but that's what's in there. And those that'll they'll, they'll, those have you know a residential rate, small commercial, large commercial, and so on. So, and you can kind of do a, a, a mapping between Minnesota um, customer classes and you know comparable classes in Ohio. Um, there's also uh, hourly solar production profiles that are needed, and you can define your own. You can put whatever you want. You could put a you know a, a particular system in there or whatever what have you uh, and you need to line those up with the customer loads um, you can uh, what's in there now is there's there's five orientations and we simulated a number of systems for Minnesota and that's available so that's you know you have a south facing and an east southeast facing and so on I forget exactly but but uh, there's five in there now and then you can again add any that you want you have to define electric rates because that's an important part obviously of your cost effectiveness and then there's a bunch of other assumptions that we won't go into the regression model uses this payback for predictor that's one input and the other one is the fraction of customers who've, who've already adopted solar uh, so there's these two predictor variables one of the second one is just kind of calculated as a function of what's in there now and what's your what's your forecasting you know, what's your you know each year that changes during the training you know how does that the uh, the fraction change um, and the thought there is that to the extent that you have adoption in your defined territory you know that will actually affect adoption by others as well kind of um, this, you know, they're, they're influenced by what they see out there, so to speak. And you're either an adopter or not, and you get assigned a one or a zero. And the um, and so the training then produces the sensitivity uh, to these factors. The output is probability of adoption per customer and the total adoption in the region. We looked at the historical rates, and the and the solid lines are actuals. Uh, this is data collected in the state of Minnesota specifically on historical adoption. And then we took that and just did a curve fit that you see with the dotted lines. And that's what we used for our forecast. So all the forecasts that you see today are based on those dotted curves. And then we calculate simple payback and that's our, one of our predictor variables. And I won't go through the details here, but you see, you know, it takes into account what's the bill savings today we, we apply an escalation factor going back for our training period. Um, we look at the PV cost that we just saw on the previous slide. There were some incentives. 
ITC credits, and so we calculate payback from that. Okay, so at this point, we'll go through the Excel Energy case study. Uh, Brian, should I uh, stop for questions, or should I just go through it and take questions at the uh, at the end? Uh, let, let's pause here since we're getting ready to, to transition from one part of the presentation to another. Do people have questions about the method or anything that Ben just presented? Okay, I'm not hearing any questions. Oh, is that somebody who wants to ask a question? Okay, I heard some noise, but maybe, maybe maybe not. I'm not hearing any questions, so if you think you're asking one, you're probably on mute. So um, why don't we go ahead, Ben, and, and uh, go into the next section. Okay, I'll, and I'll stop at the end of each section. So this is Excel Energy, and so we have now defined the region as all of the customers in Excel Energy service territory. Um, and if we look back historically, this is the ad adoption patterns. And so this, this is the data that then went into our training or some of the data that went into our training. And we see, uh, you know, year by year from 2008, uh, who, you know, how many adopters there were. And we also know what the capacity of those systems were and we can tally them up and so on. So today, you know, we're seeing something on the order of seven or 800 uh, adopters per year for residential. Uh, and then the next chart is the uh, commercial adoption. And so we can see that and it's pretty uh, steady, steady increase over time. And we're seeing, uh, you know, a couple hundred adopters per year or, or, or a little more now. Um, so all of this goes into the, the, the training. Um, we break the utility down by the total number of customers. Uh, and of course, the big one you see up top is residential without heating, and there's over a million customers there. Um, and, and this is a, so there's a lot of simplifications in this model. Um, and just so it's clear, each of these rows, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, million, over a million customers in total. But we, we simplify this by saying each row, all of those customers in that row is treated identically. So we have one uh, load profile that's associated with residential without heating, okay? And we assign it uh, the residential service rate, and that's the most common one. And if you look at the total build energy for residential customers without heating, and you divide it by the total number of customers, you get seven megawatt hours per year, each customer. And so when we, we talk about that customer, you know, we are, we are considering everybody in that class identically, but we know that there's a million of them, right? Um, and obviously there are differences, every customer is different and they live in different areas and they have slightly different curves and so on. They're all on the same rate, of course, that's the same, but they'll, they'll have a different roof shape and so on and so forth. And, and, and so there's, there's a lot of variations. And so this is uh, intended to be a very simplified model, but it's treating kind of the average customer. And when we, when we look at, um, when we look at, uh, uh, a change, for example, in the rate, we're going to say, well, what happens when we put a demand rate? Well, we're going to change, we're going to compare our baseline to the change. And so we're applying that just to these average customers, right? Um, this is also simplified a little bit because not every single rate is modeled. And so what the rates that you see on the right um, are, are, are ones that we used. And so that is, um, so we've got these these residential services, the uh, small general, general service, and so on. And so the way these are paired up aren't exactly right, 
but they're just kind of you know representative and we're trying to get a get a get an idea here of of what the response would be and of course the 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 main ones we're concerned about here is the uh, you know the the big numbers of customers those are the main ones that we're that we're really trying to zero in on when you get up to the large you know the really large industrial customers um, th those have their own unique features they're, they're, when we try to model those for example we don't have a lot of good data on those and there's a there's um, this isn't a claiming to be accurate when it comes to very specific cases but but we want to have a good model that that covers kind of the average cases the typical customers electric space heating was was uh, also that's basically a little under three percent of the residential customers those are all treated as kind of standard customers uh, that's another simplification there's seasonal weighting applied so you've got different rates for different seasons there's just kind of seasonal weighting um, for the non-TOD pricing there's also seasonal weighting for the general service demand rate which technically are different rates for different seasons there's other there's other things like um, there's a credit for usage above 400 times the billing demand for general service that's not included um, uh, you know th there there are different rates for primary service and secondary service that's the interconnection voltage um, we're just assuming secondary here um, and so there's there are some simplifications here that that need to be um, kind of acknowledged well we put our best case together and we define our baseline uh, as described and this is our forecast um, so this is uh, this is the cumulative adoption shown here for rooftop and it, it shows both the commercial in orange and the residential in blue and so we see by 2030 for example as we go forward that we're looking at a, a total installed capacity of uh, just over 140 megawatts of of uh, rooftop solar and now so so that's our baseline and that's what we're going to compare against here and now we're going to make a tweak to one of the, the inputs and that tweak first we're going to look at uh, a demand rate so the idea here is uh, well and this sort of answers the question you know does solar support a peak load reduction is it helping to reduce the peak and in fact you know you can see that in some months it definitely does reduce the peak um, so again this is our average customer so if you just look at uh, the hourly loads over the year and you see, and you and there's there's assumptions about what solar is installed and how it's oriented and so on but for the case that we're considering our, our baseline um, we're seeing that that actually does reduce demand for a few of the months but not all of the months some months it doesn't uh, in winter it doesn't affect it at all but in summer it, it reduces a little and this kind of begs the question um, well maybe you know maybe the, if if they shifted to a demand rate there may be some benefit there you know if we could help to reduce the demand charge and and we're kind of left with the question well what if uh, sure in the summer it would it would help it would help residential customers lower their bills in the summer because their their demand charges are going to go down and we're going to get a benefit on our energy rates as well but of course that's kind of counterbalanced by the fact that well we're not going to be getting much in the non-summer months and so the question is well how does this affect the rates and how does this affect the forecast so we have to define what we mean by that demand rate scenario so we're we're creating a fictitious rate at this point that doesn't exist and excel to my knowledge anyway excel energy is not proposing any demand charge so this is kind of you know a bit academic but it's 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 just to say hey let's take a look at this case we're gonna we're gonna create a new demand rate and we're gonna say that um just since we don't have one today, we're gonna have to make an assumption about what the demand charge is. And so what we'll say is, let's assume that the 
the seasonally adjusted demand charge, it's the same for the general service customers of $12.70 per kilowatt. And we're also going to make sure that the, that it, for the for most other for most of the customers, there's really no change in the total bill, so that's going to say stand at uh, seven hundred and ninety five dollars for the year, and so you see in the in the table below what our baseline rate is. That's the one that people uh, experience today, and it shows the fixed charge, the energy charges, and of course there's no demand charge. And then on the lot final row, we see the resident our, our new fictitious residential demand rate, same fixed charge. We introduce this demand charge and we adjust the energy charge downward so that um, so that the annual bill stays the same. So on the right side, you see the annual bill calculation uh, and, and that's the basis for our energy price adjustment. Hopefully that makes sense. So. So the bottom line is, is we incur a new charge at twelve dollars per kilowatt demand charge. That is over the, we every you know every month we're going to look what our peak demand is, and we're going to see what the what the peak kilowatts are, and we're going to get charged twelve dollars for those kilowatts. But in exchange, we're going to reduce our energy price from 9.8 cents down to 6.7 cents. So we're gonna see, that's a little bit of a trade-off and we're gonna to have to see how that affects things. Uh, and for the people who don't adopt solar, well, it's not gonna affect them at all, really. I mean, obviously every customer is different. Again, some will, some will have an increased bill, some will have a reduced bill, but the average customer, it's not gonna affect them. And this breaks down now, again, based on our, our hourly load and our hourly solar, and we're sizing our solar to, for 100% offset. This breaks down our monthly bills between the solar and the non-solar. And obviously, uh, we can see that our, our monthly bills without solar are higher in the summertime. So if we look at the June, July, August, uh, you know, September, those are the big bills. And sure enough, you put solar in and our bill goes way down. And uh, of course, throughout the year, obviously the biggest effect is energy. So the orange bars, you know, disappear uh, in all but, uh, you know, three months here. So our energy, our energy uh, charges are eliminated by putting in solar. And if and also those four months we see it's a little hard to see in this chart, and, and it's so it turns out to be a small effect, but but our demand charges are going down in those four months as well. In the non-summer months, of course, our demand charges aren't affected at all. Anyway, this breaks down um, the 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 different components. You know, the fixed charges, of course, stay the same. Energy charges go way down and the demand charges go down very slightly in the summer months. And here, then we apply this to our, our, uh, our residential demand uh, scenario. So this is, this is a new forecast now. And so again, we're saying every residential customer now is on this residential demand. Well, you know, in that hypothetical world, what would happen? And we see uh, overall that there's a reduction in solar adoption. It goes down 14 megawatts of cumulative installed capacity. About, it's about a 10% effect, a uh, little under 10% relative to our baseline. And again, that's, that's 13 years of forecasted adoption. So if you will, whatever, it's a little like a, a little less than 1% a year. Of, of effect, which is not huge, but it's, it, you know, that's kind of where the numbers lie. Uh, the next scenario we're going to look at is, okay, we, we imposed, in the first case, we imposed a demand charge on every customer and we saw what the effect of solar adoption would be. Now we're going to restore that and we're going to do another case, another independent case. 
which is, let's say there was a time of day rate imposed on all customers. Well, what would that look like? Um, so this is the time of day rate, uh, the period definitions. And so we see, depending on the month and weekdays versus weekend, we see a uh, different time of day periods that are just highlighted in different colors there. Um, so it's uh, uh, 9 a.m. to uh, 9 p.m. It can be the on-peak period during the summer months and so on. Um, these are the rates. So we are using a, a, a published time of day rate for Excel. And, um, and so we can compare this table down below compares the, uh, the two rates. So our baseline rate, everybody's paying 9.8 cents. And if we switch to time of day, um, they pay a lot higher than that on peak. Um, but then there's, a, 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 you know, other non summer months on peak that, that are, uh, you know, still high, but but less than the, the, the worst case. And then the off the off peak periods, uh, as defined in that chart, they go way down. So it's like we're paying half price for our off peak energy, but a lot higher for on peak energy. And and then we think, well, okay, well, what if we did solar? Well, what would we, what would we be able to, what would solar buy us in this world? And hopefully we'll be displacing a lot of this on peak energy. Um, probably not all of it, but we'll be able to essentially get 21 cents in some cases versus only getting nine cents in others. So that there's some potential for, for bill savings here. But of course, we'll also get dinged with a lot of the high on peak energy as well when if, if solar isn't there for us or our loads are high or, or what have you. Um, and, uh, and also we might save off peak, which is good because you know, obviously like at nighttime, that's gonna be the off peak time. So that, that's gonna save us some money. But on the other hand, you know, we're, we're also gonna have solar displacing off peak energy, which doesn't buy us as much. Well, how does this all uh, translate to uh, uh, the likelihood of adoption? And, and that's what we see in this chart. So this is a pretty small effect. This is, again, this is compared to baseline. We do our forecast, we go out you know, 13 years and we're looking at the cumul total cumulative adoption by 2030. And it's only a four megawatt difference. Uh, it's a decrease so that the overall imposing a time of day rate, at least under the definitions and pricing and so on that we assumed in this study, it does it does tend to decrease the amount of solar going in, but it's a pretty minor effect. It's about a three percent over, you know, thirteen years, or you know, it's way under a one percent a year kind of effect. Okay, so that's that's time of day. And now we're gonna look at another scenario or actually a set of scenarios for incentives. And this is basically a, a buy down incentive. And and this could be a, a ratepayer funded incentive. It could be taxpayer, it could be where, whoever, it doesn't matter. The customer gets a buy down incentive. And the intent here is to stimulate more adoption of solar and how you know, we now have a tool that allows us <clears throat> to, to predict if you put in a dollar a watt or a $2 watt incentive, well, what's the uptake gonna be? What is that gonna buy you? Um, so he here we have, uh, everybody gets these, we're looking at uh, four different incentives and we're comparing to the baseline, the column on the left side of $0 per watt. And we can now predict, this is the cumulative adoption to 2030 again, that those, uh, the charts that we've seen, and what's the totals that we get out of this. And if we put in, for example, a, a half a dollar, a, a 50 cent a watt incentive, our residential incentive is gonna go from 58 megawatts to 69 megawatts. So there's a little bit of a bump there. If we increase it to a dollar a watt, it goes to 83 megawatts and so on. And, and so we, we see the residential adoption, we see the commercial adoption and total adoption. 
Um, so that, that's like if we're trying to do some planning and trying to adjust and promote solar, this is, you know, this is the type of response that we might see from those, from those uh, incentives. Um, down below, we see uh, just a, a little analysis then. The, we look at the increase over the baseline, the percentage increase. And then one way to look at it is the cost. Um, that is the, the dollars you put in for the incentive relative to the amount of increase over baseline. So for example, to look at the, uh, the $1 per watt incentive, you, you do a dollar a watt and you get a, you get a almost 60 megawatts, 59 megawatts of, of increased adoption. You get a total of 205 megawatts of, of adoption. But what does that dollar really buy you? you, you in a way, you want to look at it like that dollar you're spending, you would have had that the baseline anyway. So you're really buying 59 additional megawatts with that dollar incentive. And so, um, so it's it, in effect, it's it's three dollars and fifty cents. It comes out to be three dollars and fifty cents uh, per watt of new capacity that wouldn't have been installed otherwise, and so on for the different um, for the different the four uh, incentives shown here. So that's Excel. I'll stop uh, here if there's questions about the Excel energy. Hey, Ben, this is Bethany from Enro. Hi. Um, hi. Um, so just a more clarifying question. On the, for the time of day and the demand charge cases, did you account for any potential um, shifting of demand or sort of just alternative uh, kind of usage patterns that customers might have in response to those um, rate structures? Or did you just assume the static load profiles that were provided by the utility. Yeah, good question. And and this is yeah, the just the static load profile. So we didn't there was no additional, you know, behavioral analysis and that kind of thing. Um and 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 by and large, I mean some customers do shift. And of course, you know, we're looking at a world now with solar plus storage and that's gonna cause shifting as well. But this yeah. study just, you know, you put in solar or you don't put in solar and and the customers just keep going with their existing uh, load usage patterns, um, and and that's what we, you know, I can't make a gross generalization, but that is something that we see. You know, some people you start you you put in a time of day rate, and people don't even know that there was a rate change kind of thing. So that's they're not going to change their behavior. Yeah. Like, but 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 you're right for those customers that that really wanted to really try to change their behavior uh, in you know in their uh, their usage you know that that's not that's not considered here okay thank you yep Hi, ben, this is, uh, I, oh, go ahead this is uh holly i'm wondering since this is there are no active proposals for residential demand charges if you since we're kind of exploring outside the box here if you modeled a coincident demand charge, because it seems like with today's technology, it, to me it seems a little silly that we're still doing customer specific non coincident demand charges when the goal is to send the price signal to reduce the system peak. And I'm just curious if you were thinking about that at all in the scenario designs. Uh, that was not done. That, that, that could be a, a fairly simple thing now as well. And, and again, it's just, uh, it would it would just use the same load profiles. It wouldn't assume any kind of behavioral shift uh, in, as well. But that's that that could be done as well. Hi Ben, this is Lisa. Um, can you just walk through the the three dollar and fifty cents line at the bottom of the the last slide that you were on? Just I just want to make sure I understand what that represents. Uh. Yeah, so so this is the, uh, sorry the dollar a watt. The uh, the three dollars and fifty cents at the bottom of the the yeah that. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, to get there, I think we have to start at the top, right? So th this column. Um, so we offer a dollar a watt incentive. 83 megawatts of residential solar go in. Um, there's 122 megawatts of commercial, so that adds to 205. Uh, the, if we subtract 205, uh, excuse me, we subtract 146 from 205, that shows a an increase of 59 megawatts over the baseline, or a, that's a that's a 40 percent increase over the baseline. Okay. So then we take the total cost of that program. That's spending a dollar a watt times 205 megawatts. Uh, for, yeah, that's a dollar a watt for all of those customers that participate. Uh, that comes out to, uh, it's not shown here, but that's some dollar amount. And if you take that total program cost in dollars and divide it by the 59 megawatts, you come out to $3.50 uh, uh, per got watt. Got it. Yep. Okay. I got it. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Ben. Um, this is Lise hey, uh, from Commerce. Hey. Um, I'm assuming, I think we talked about this before, but I'm, I'm assuming you could modify on your own the modeling tool to try other types of rate options. Like I'm um, wondering about Excel's pilot rate uh, time for time of use instead of the, the standard time of use rate. It just has a, another peak within the, a higher peak within the peak zone. So then you get a shoulder peak and then a, and then a, on either side of the peak. Uh, yeah, that's, uh... So, so, so I didn't look at that, and um, you know that's just another that's another use of the tool. You could throw that one in as well. Okay, um, just verifying that you could do that. So, <laughs> well, technically, uh, <laughs> to, I, I mean, strictly speaking, you know, the way the, the, the that spreadsheet is kind of structured, I think we can we we have room for three time and day periods over the year. So that's, I'm not, I'm not sure, but it sounds like that might be a fourth period required. Um, if it can stay to three, that would be, that would be very simple to put in. Uh, ben, this is Brian. Uh, it, it kind of follow up on Lisa's question. Um, it, it, it is, if, if, if we wanted to specifically get to that scenario, would it be require substantial modification or would that be a fairly straightforward thing to do to the tool itself? Uh, no, it would be a, I mean, it would, you, you know how spreadsheets are, you just got to add a column here and make sure it tallies up right and that kind of thing. It's not a, yeah, that's all it is. So it's, it's not a, it's not a very difficult thing, but you, you just have to do it. So it's not just plugging yeah, and, in numbers is all. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and if, if, if there are things that that are of high importance that we that the committee thinks that we need to get to uh we can consider making simple changes but we are of course under a time constraint so we're we're uh um it would it would have to be a fairly limited number of changes anyway i just thought that you know at least in case that was something that commerce really wanted to see we could talk about that yeah so it would be probably a good idea to just as we come up with things, so we have this idea of the coincident peak and then the pilot time of day. Um, you know, let's, we could make a list here, I suppose. And, and if it, and if those are like priority questions or whatever, then, then we could, uh, we could make a tweak accordingly. Okay. And, and I will say that uh, uh, Jenna uh, in, from our office is in fact online and taking notes on all this. So uh, she's, she's, We'll have uh, these kinds of questions uh, captured. Excellent. Other questions on the Excel uh, case study? Uh, and Ben, this is Brian, uh, and I'm just looking at the time. We do need to keep moving here. Um, so if you can kind of keep an eye on the clock, because uh, we got to kind of wrap up uh, this section by, I think it is uh, by 1030 our time. Right. Okay. 
Uh, sounds good. Thanks for the reminder. Okay, Minnesota Power. Uh, we so here we see the historical adoption, and we're so this time now we're instead of 700 or whatever per year, we're getting something more like 30 per year, 40 per year. So it's a different, you know, different beast altogether here. Commercial, I'm not going to go through these numbers because it turns out that um, so in the data that we had available, the PV system costs are not reported by Minnesota Power. Uh, so the what we had to do is, in order to, to train this model, of course, we we need to calculate payback and to calculate payback you need, well, what was the cost of PV? We don't have that. And so for the for Minnesota Power, we're, we're assuming that the model coefficients are the same as, the, as for Excel, which is another way of saying, we assume that customers are going to respond to, to you know, price, you know, signals in the same way, it, it, the Minnesota Power customers, the same way as Excel Energy customers. Um, so the, we, we also had uh, Minnesota Power provided some, some data for the big industrial kind of customers. Uh, we just kind of thought we'd keep it simple here. We're gonna just look at the residential and commercial customers. This represents, you know, over 99% of the customers. And so that's really what we're focused on here. Again, we did some, uh, uh, the, the, some other simplification. You know, you get into these rates and there's all kinds of variations as you could imagine. But it, for residential, we use the seasonal rate. Uh, solar in, in sense incentives continued are assumed in the baseline to continue at their current rates through 2030. I'll describe that in more detail, but just to know at this point that that these uh, incentives uh, are kind of continuing for our baseline. This is the breakdown of the customers. Again, this is just residential and commercial. Shows the number of customers, um, the annual usage, and the assigned re electric rate. And here's our forecast. Uh, so going out to 2030, we're looking at around 30 megawatts of cumulative adoption that's combined residential and commercial. Um, okay, so again, we're gonna look at a demand rate. Um, and in this case, uh, it, it's done just a little bit differently. There's a little subtlety here. So we're gonna say, assume first of all that the uh, so we're not going to just take the demand rate from another customer class. We're going to calculate a new one. And we're going to assume that the bill is the same for non-solar customers. So it comes out to $1,000 and $1,028. That's going to be the same whether you're on your standard residential rate or this new residential demand rate. And we're going to say that the breakdown between fixed energy charges and, de and demand charges are the same as for the commercial general service customers. So the demand charges in this, in this table, you, you'll see the $133. Um, that's 13% of the total bill. And that's going to be, and that 13% is, is basically what, this, what the commercial uh, general service customers see. Demand charges represent about 13% of the bill. And so that now defines uh, our, our new fictitious rate here. You get $8 for your fixed charge, $7.25 per kilowatt is your demand charge. And then your energy, you get a, you get a little benefit on your energy charge. It goes from 10.8 cents down to 9.3 cents. That's the new rate we'll use for this study. And so we see uh, it's really not a big effect. It's, you know, again, over 13 years, we're looking at a decrease of, of 0.7 megawatts. So it's like a 2.4 effect in total. Um, it's, it's, uh, that, that was kind of a little bit of a surprise to me. It's just, uh, if you, if you chose to do this demand charge, um, that's kind of the effect on adoption. Time of day rate, 
similar thing. So uh, except in this case, we're not going to create a fictitious one. We're going to use the Minnesota Power's uh, pilot rate. Um, so, so in this case, now we're going to say, okay, all residential customers now go on to this pilot rate. Um, and that rate is shown on this chart. The, the, the period is slightly different from Excel's. It's now 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., Monday to Friday. You know, other hours and holidays and so on are, are, are off peak. Um, the critical peak pricing events are not included. That's just a simplification. And so we see the breakdown below. So we are, the baseline customers are, gonna, are paying you know, 10.8 cents and that will then be, instead of paying that, we're gonna split the energy time periods into on and off peak and you're gonna either pay 15.7 or 7.8 uh, off peak. And here's our forecast and it's, it's hardly even noticeable. <laughs> which is kind of interesting. I mean, this is well within the area of this study by, you know, easily. Um, essentially, there's no change. There's, there's just saying if, you know, if you did this, if you impose this rate, solar would just continue to go in as, as, uh, as before. Then we looked at incentives and we did this a little differently. Um, so, just so we understand how this program works, the Solar Sense program pays uh, in, in 2019. They paid this 78 cents for each estimated kilowatt hour during the first year. So there's an example, and I just took this off the Minnesota Power website. If you have an eight kilowatt system in Duluth, it's got 20 degree tilt. It's south. Uh, what is that? Southwest facing, 88 percent shading profile you know you you put this into pv watts and it and it estimates uh 8874 kilowatt hours a year uh or 1100 kilowatt hours per installed kilowatt um the rebate is then calculated using that uh, that um pv watts result so we take 78 cents a kilowatt hour uh, and multiply it by that estimated kilowatt hour production in the first year, 88.74, and we get $6,922. That would be the, the rebate amount, an upfront rebate amount that the customer is, uh, is entitled to. Uh, this tool deals in dollars per watt, so we just translate that as 87 cents per watt, which is essentially the equivalent of saying, Minnesota Power pays, uh, in 2019, they paid, uh, at least at least for this particular customer in the example, they paid 24% of the total installed cost. Um, that's before the ITC. Um, and the intent is that this would probably continue this type of level of, comp of, of rebate. There's also uh, an imposition of a maximum of $20,000. And so that affects, if, if you look, we had both the residential and the commercial kind of average customers, um, that affects our, our commercial customer. So that customer had 54 megawatt hours per year of consumption. And you do the math behind it, and that comes out to 41 cents a watt rebate for them. So in other words, for our average customer that we'll consider in this cut study, uh, the commercial customers are getting 41 cents a watt rebate. And, and, the, and the reason it's lower is, is due to this maximum rebate uh, as, as part of the program. Yep. You just got back to my office. Oh, I think we have, yeah. somebody needs to mute themselves. Um, so in this case, for Minnesota Power, we're going to talk about the, the baseline scenario. And that assumes 30% uh, residential rebate every year through uh, 2020 through 2030. Um, these are rebates that are not approved yet, but that's the assumption here. That's the intent. 
Um, and again, if you could uh, mute yourself, that would be appreciated if you're not speaking. Um, as the price declines, it, I might add that that 30% goes down. So, so that um, it's just, for example, it, you know, in 2025, it'll be down at 70 cents a watt. So it would go down from today's you know, 78 cents, it would decline to 70 cents. And, and, and again, that's corresponding to the decline in, in installed PV price. Um, there, the, so, so our baseline scenarios is basically this 30% residential rebate and the commercial one is just, just, it's just fixed at 41 cents a watt because it's kind of capped at that point. That's our baseline. For the low scenario, we're assuming a 0% rebate. I don't know, I just thought it, we could do a, maybe a high scenario as well, but that, that just seemed like unlikely that it would be higher than the baseline. So we're kind of our baseline and then the low scenario. And so the low scenario uh, decreases the uh, the total um, cumulative adoption by 4.8 megawatts, or look at 15 percent, a kind of effect relative to the baseline. Okay, um, and that's that's uh, Minnesota Power questions there. Uh, ben, this is Brian. I, I had a quick question that occurred to me. Because um, we're not looking at the IPC in all of this, um, and it, but it, uh, it, the IPC is embedded in the adoption rates of the historic kind of training data that you were looking at. But of course, it's set to expire uh, soon. Here, um, you know, are, are, does the model effectively assume that the IPC is continuing or? Um, is that washed out of it somehow? So the the baseline, actually, all all the cases that we've seen here includes the ITC as currently scheduled. So you get the it goes from the thirty percent down to the twenty six percent down to the what is it twenty four twenty two percent I forget, and and commercial and residential is treated separately. So as as uh, currently embedded in the tax code that's what we're that's what we're uh, modeling here and it does eventually you know go away for the residential so. okay so, so the fact that it's it's embedded in the historic data then it is accounted for i mean we're, we're not we're not accidentally um using that training to uh to forecast for continuing itc it's actually been pulled no, this, out of the economic yeah, the training used 30% and the forecast used the declining amounts. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, one hopefully quick question. Um, is there a way to, or is, would the model somehow identify where you might get too high of an incentive where it starts to become more like a lottery and you actually drive less? adoption than if you were to spread it out a little more? Uh, I, I guess I'm not exactly following. Um, well, so like if it was really high, people might hold out to get the really high incentive and say, you know, I'll just, if I don't get it this year, I'll wait till next year. And I mean, I, I realize that's really difficult to model, but um, I guess practically speaking, there's also the fact that if you, have a larger incentive, fewer numbers of systems can use it. Yeah, so, well, first of all, no, that's not modeled. Um, that's pretty hard to do. Uh, it, I'll mention in other projects that we have modeled this, uh, this transition period with the ITC. We, what we saw was, uh, I think this was pretty much around the country, but, um, that in 2016 there was a, a pretty large boost and that was sort of the thought was that that was kind of in anticipation of the tax credit going away well it turned out that it was extended but so but that was kind of a last minute thing and so you saw this boost in 2016 so we in some of our predictive models we sort of included i there's different ways you can define it but you sort of do look at 
well, what's the payback if you install today versus next year, you know, kind of thing. And you can define a predictive variable accordingly. So no, nothing like that was done here. And, you know, again, that it, to do something like that, like who knows, maybe the ITC will come back, you know, in, in 2025, you know, that's possible, I suppose. But, but, you know, that that's sort of a, a matter of defining those scenarios that we consider, you know, you know, of interest to us. So, so those, those were not, were not included. And I, and I think, honestly, I think, um, you know, that that's kind of a level of sophistication that this, that this simplified model probably doesn't really lend itself to. Um, but you can okay, always that's define. That's reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, just, I guess, wondering if there's a theoretical way to do that, but it sounds pretty complicated. Yeah. Customer behavior is, is hard and, and, and that's, and that is what we're trying to do here is model, you know, yeah. the, the, the behavior and, you know, what they're thinking is, <laughs> is, yeah. is kind of hard, but w this is just payback, payback today. That's your input, you know, and, and, yeah. and, and, and cumulative adoption to date is the other one. So. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah. Thanks. Ben. Uh, and I have uh, a question then, because, because obviously what we see and maybe this goes to some of what we said is that this model assumes that if there's an incentive available, everybody has access to that incentive and there's not a cap on it. Yeah. The, I mean, the only cap is this, is this one for Minnesota power that the $20,000 cap. And that's per person. That, yeah, that's per system. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, but a lot of times we'll see, I mean, as we've seen with the solar incentives, the, the, there will be a total program cap so that there's a limited, so, and, and that's, it kind of goes to some of what Lise was, I think, um, noting, right. That, right. That, that I didn't get in this year because I was too late. I'll, I'll, and so rather than actually do the installation, I'm going to put it off and see if I can get in next year. Got it. Okay, I think I miss a, I misunderstood, Lise. Um, but yeah, that that isn't that is not taken into account here. So ah, okay, okay. That was every everybody all good gets points. everybody gets the the incentive here. So okay, who, who cool. wants it? Thanks, Ben. Hey, I have a question. This is Ralph Jacobson. Hey, Ralph. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, um, and I'm sorry I had to step out for a short meeting, but. Um, so you might have covered this already, and I apologize. You can just uh, tell me if so. But when you were showing um, what uh, compared to the baseline, if we were to um, um, split out the uh, demand, so a residential demand um, from the energy, and then you um, adjusted the energy so that the uh, charge so that the bill would come out the same from the customer's perspective. Um, is in your model does it include um, what from the utilities perspective I mean that's a lot of customers that um, they got to um, you know charge what they do to get their cost recovery and so does this result in let's say some source of money being tapped in order to equalize or make it so that we don't have to have a rate case et cetera et cetera um, so there's a lot of work that goes into developing rates and getting them approved through rate cases and so on. And, and this is, you know, Ben's super simple way of estimating what that rate might look like. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, there would be, there would be a reduction in the energy price and there'd be, a, you know, a lot of modeling and, and so on. And, and we would, and, and it probably wouldn't be, resting on just the average customer there would be a lot more that go into the uh there would if if there was to be a new rate that was desi designed like this um obviously it would have to be approved i don't know if that was what you were getting at but this 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 uh i mean <laughs> you know that's the way it's done is it has to go through the the uh regulators and and that has would have to be approved and yeah. and I'm, I, I'm 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 not suggesting here by any stretch that this is you know a, a recommendation or that it should happen or that it might happen or or that it ever will happen it's just 
it's more like exercising this tool to say, well, so, you know, let's 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 sort of think outside the box and what would happen? Would that would just completely destroy the industry, or would it could it boost the industry? Like we just don't know until we try something like well, this. Well, yeah. See, so. they're doing that in other states. I think in Massachusetts, there's uh, um, they've been decoupled so that uh, in in the rate retail uh, rate rate um, residential. Um, but those that's a deregulated market. Um, so, you know, what's the analogous pathway in a um, highly regulated market like we have in Minnesota is, the, I guess, the core of my question. Yep, yep. Well, we'll have to say about that. I, I can't really address that. I should probably move on to Otter Tail because they were at 10 minutes left or a little under 10 minutes, uh, if, if I may. So for, for uh, Otter Tail, uh, but again, now here once again, I mean, we this is this is very very little adoption historically. We're looking at now in this case like seven systems per year coming in, something about on that order. Uh, and I, again, I'm not going to go through these charts in detail. You could see them uh, for yourself if that's of interest to you. And the reason I didn't want to is is that again, as with Minnesota Power, we didn't have the PV system costs available to us. Uh, and and for, furthermore, the incentive data was basically not complete. And so again, to train this model for Otter Tail Power customers, um, we, we, we didn't have the information that's required to be able to model this kind of consumer behavior. And so once again, we're, we're re relying on the behavior of the Excel energy customers to inform, you know, how Otter Tail Power customers are going to respond to changes in cost effectiveness, it, which is another way of saying, we're going to take the same model coefficients for Excel and apply them to Otter Tail. Um, we have uh, also, there was uh, 356 kilowatts of, of solar capacity you know, a little less than, you know, 27% of it was installed on farms. There's some simplifying going on here. So we we said we were calling farm adoption uh, is, is, is included with the commercial adoption. We had our customer accounts taken from the FERC data. Um, we had, uh, we had um, uh, the residential customers on the four most popular rates are included. So uh, so we've got basically 99.4% of the customers accounted for here. And so we're, uh, we're uh, only the commercial customers on the three most popular rates, uh, plus the large general service are included. Anyway, bottom line is we're covering almost all, but not every single customer here. Um, the uh, also other simplifications, similarly, energy and demand pricing, seasonally waiting going on. And again, that's just kind of due to the simple model of the uh, the simple spreadsheet model. Um, the large general service time of day rates were seasonally weighted as well and the uh, by demand period. Um, and then there's some other customer counts on different, uh, there's these different uh, controlled service rate codes they're not differentiated here and so on. Bottom line is, you know, again, if you sift through all these rates, they get a little complicated and we don't know exactly which customers are on which rates and so on. And so we're kind of sort of shoehorning them into some, some standard rates here. Uh, and that's what we see on this. So we've got a, these different customers that are included in the study for the, the two sectors. Uh, the different usage per customer is shown and the electric rate that we associated with those customers are shown here. Here's our baseline. So we're looking at, uh, in this case, go out to 2030 and we're a little on like whatever, a little over 15 megawatts of uh, forecasted cumulative adoption. Okay, so now we're gonna try the, our demand rate scenario. Um, and in this case, we're going to, uh, they already have a residential service control demand for residential customers. And so that's the rate we're going to use. So we're not going to create a new demand rate in this case. We're going to use an existing approved rate. Um, and the, the, the table there shows the price difference. 
So again, we're, well, first of all, our fixed price goes up slightly. We're going to uh, impose this $8 kilowatt demand charge and our energy price goes down accordingly by a few cents. And we're looking at a decrease of 1.3 megawatts. So we're looking at, this is kind of like an eight and a half percent type of effect cumulatively over that 13 year period. Uh, the incentive scenario, uh, we, we, we didn't do a time of day scenario and honestly, I kind of forget the reason why, but there was a good reason. Uh, we did an incentives uh, study as well here and this shows the effect here. Um, and, and so there's, you know, half a, you know, 50 cents a watt up to $2 a watt, uh, residential and commercial. And so th this shows the cost. So in this case, if you did a dollar a watt type of incentive, you would, uh, you would have an increase of eight megawatts over the baseline of 15.6 megawatts, which corresponds to um, this $3 per watt of increase by that type of calculation. So anyway, so there's the, uh, there's the study and we've seen this chart first of all, but uh, it kind of lays out, you know, we've, we've, we've done this, this tool and it's obviously very simple, but it is, ki it is kind of the, a tool for the first time we're able to say, you know, well, what is the effect of these rate changes? What is the effect of an incentive? How can I, how can I design a program that, uh, that will lead us to the, to our goal amount of solar installations? Or if I, if I make these changes, will it, will it help or harm the, the solar industry? And, you know, will it, will it lead to our, our ability to meet these goals, whether they're city goals or, or state goals? Um, and we and we see the effect of these these changes, these demand charges that we're imposing, or the or the uh, time of day rate changes, uh, or, or incentives, and and we, and we see kind of not not that these numbers are real precise, I don't think, but but they're sort of indicative. So we're seeing demand charges in the, you know, it's kind of like. You know, to a 2.4% for Minnesota power up to 14 for Excel. So that's kind of the range that we would expect. And those all depend again on, on how, how we defined those demand charges. Uh, and, and, uh, and as, as Bethany pointed out, you know, this is, you know, this is not coincident demand charges. This is the standard demand charge calculations. There's no behavioral changes or anything. But it gives us an idea of what of what kind of a, a effect that these demand charges would have. Turns out the time of day rates they really don't change things a lot. Um, it's negligible for Minnesota Power, and and it's like a three percent over thirteen years for Excel Energy. Um, not 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 very big. Uh, and of course, the incentives are just whatever you define it. That's kind of like you 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 have an input and you get an output and you and you can design your program accordingly. And we now have this ability to, to see what that, you know, what that uh, effect might be. Um, so the tool seems to be versatile and, and we can make changes and look at lots of different scenarios. And, and that's kind of the, the, the upshot of this, uh, of this set of case studies.